Welcome to the Jay Martin Show. If you're new to the show, my name is Jay. I'm an investor and I'm looking for the smartest home for my cash. If that sounds like you, then I think you're gonna like what we do here. My guest today is Matthew Pippenberg, partner at Matterhorn Asset Management. And we cover a ton of ground in today's interview, starting with some near-term current events, the hot war in the Middle East, and we wrap up talking about the American empire, what stage and inning we may be in, and how this all ends. Fascinating conversation. I know you're going to like this. Matthew has a phenomenal way of articulating very complex subject matter in a way that anyone can understand. So you're going to take away a lot from this piece of content. Special announcement before we jump in. I just published The Commodity University. This is a 10 chapter course for new commodity investors who wanna understand how to begin allocating capital to the world of raw materials. It's no surprise to you that investors are turning away from speculative growth stocks and focusing on the materials and resources that power our world. That's commodities. If you're curious to know more about how to begin building a portfolio in the commodity sector, check out thecommodityuniversity.com, thecommodityuniversity.com. I'm super jacked on this and the feedback's been phenomenal. So check that out. But here is Matthew Pippenberg. Enjoy. This is Jay Martin. All right, here I am with Matthew Pippenberg. It's great to have you back on the show, Matthew. I appreciate you making the time. Oh, looking forward to it. Always enjoy it, Jay. So it'll be good. Because you've been traveling like crazy, right? Before I hit record, we counted the countries that you've just come from or are going to, and it's more than I have on both yeah. hands here. Uh, so you're busy. But uh, look, I, I love chatting with you. I want to get your thoughts on a handful of things today. I want to start with like a, a bit of a sensitive bucket, but I want to talk about the war in the Middle East. And I want to talk about it from this standpoint. So uh, we get pretty wrapped up in the the current events when a crisis like this unfolds. And that's important because the current events are important. There's human lives that we're talking about and some real atrocities that, that need a spotlight. What I try to do when these events occur is step back and say, this is not isolated. These events are rarely isolated and one-offs. They're typically part of a bigger trend or a trajectory or a cycle shift that's occurring. So that's what I want to ask you about. When you look at this, stepping back from the, 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 the near-term events, is this part of a bigger shift? Is this part of a trajectory or a trend that maybe most people are missing? What do you think? It's obviously a very important uh, question. It's a very sensitive topic. You're right to kind of coordinate it more in a geopolitical scenario on the financial and political side and look at it from that perspective, because whenever there's this much suffering, it's very hard to get past that on whatever side, you know, is suffering. And uh, in particular in the headlines now, they're, they're, they're brutal. Um, and it is, it, it almost feels cold to reduce a human event, a human tragedy uh, to some type of political or geopolitical or financial context, because it kind of makes that seem like you're drying up what is a very real problem and looking at it kind of coldly. But given the emotions involved and the sensitivities, I guess, and we're talking on a financial site, we, we have to look at these things from 30,000 feet. To your broader question, I think the geopolitical, political, and financial problems in the world, uh, not just in the U.S. or the Middle East, but in general, and the and the, certainly the political problems in particular in the U.S. do have an impact on all of these events, in my opinion. Um, if you look at it, again, this is sensitive. It's probably going to upset some listeners. And, um, you know, if you look at it from a political standpoint, um, you know, the, the U.S. is kind of seen as the world's policeman for so many decades and generations since World War II. And there's a sense that they're they're in control. They can manage things. The U.S. is politically and financially stressed, I think parties in the world that want to take advantage of those stressors are aware of that. We've had a disaster in Afghanistan. Many would argue we have a disaster in the Ukraine that our current uh, president isn't really in charge of the decisions from the State Department to the Pentagon to the cabinet. We're all kind of scratch our hands asking who's making these decisions. You know, there's there's public headlines about our border problems. Again, you can take arguments on both sides. There's public headlines about what we've done in this, what I think is an avoidable war in the Ukraine. There's certainly a massive amount of agreement that our withdrawal, the way we withdrew from Afghanistan was a disaster. We basically rearmed the Taliban with, you know, and a lot of lives were lost and it was a disaster. So you could argue, and again, some people would take offense, but you could argue that there is a sense that there is 
political weakness in the U.S., and this is a time to take advantage, there's also an awareness from the BRICS countries to the North America, South America, West Europe, Asia, there is an awareness that America is in a financial crisis and a political crisis, a cultural crisis. Um, all these things are tied together for opportunists who want to exploit this moment of weakness to take advantage of border disputes or political disputes from the South China Sea to Gaza and East Jerusalem. And again, you can't simplify it. The problem in Israel, and I've been there twice, and, and the debates around it and the emotions involved, which are very legitimate, go back generations and generations. So you can't just say, well, what happened is because America's weak or the West is weak or the financial structures are weak or the bond market's decaying. But nevertheless, you know, this goes back to the thing by Hemingway, when there's financial distress, when there's debt distress, governments usually embroil themselves in debasing the currency and finding themselves in some type of war. And we were talking about that a year ago when the Ukraine started. Now we see war in the Middle East, or hopefully it's contained, but it's hard to imagine given so many ripple effects of what happens there. I certainly hope for the best, but you know, it's an extremely sensitive part of the world. And so quick answer, I think this combination of political weakness, financial stresses are relevant uh, for opportunists on any side of the debate to take advantage of a military conflict. And then you have to skeptically ask questions. Will there be genuine efforts for peace? Who's making the decisions in Israel? Who's making the decision in the U.S.? No one's in favor of Hamas, what they've done. Um, and so will there be drum drum beating for war from Northrop Grumman or Raytheon or the cabinet or the ne neocons, et cetera. Again, I don't have all the answers for this. Um, and there are the pro-Trump camp that would say, well, if Trump was in office, this wouldn't have happened. We don't know that. We don't know that. We don't know if the left or right would have saved the day. There is, I think, a pretty, I think, accepted from Europe to the U.S., where I sit in my conversations all over the world, there's a kind of an accepted opinion that the U.S. is weaker financially and politically, and even culturally. We're a completely splintered, identity politic-driven, uh, non-United States right now. And so uh, is it a coincidence that we're seeing, you know, war in the Ukraine, now conflict in the Middle East, a disaster in Afghanistan? Is it a coincidence this is happening at the same time that we're politically fractured, socially fractured, and financially stressed from our bond markets to our, our, our debt levels to our repo markets to our reverse repo markets. Again, it sounds so dry to reduce the horrors of the last 10 days um, to something as simple as economic indicators. But unfortunately, all these things are in a blender. They're tied together, and they're very sensitive topics. They just are. But looking at it dryly economically, um, I think we'd all agree that there's a lot of stress in the in the geopolitics globally and in the U.S. in particular, and there are a lot of stresses financially globally and in the U.S., the home of the world reserve currency in the U.S. 10-year in particular. And uh, with all these stresses, little flames are popping up in the cracks, and uh, this is the latest. And of course, the, the Israeli-Palestine uh, issue goes far beyond just the last 10 days, 10 minutes. It goes back generations, but um, sadly, these fissures are getting wider now. Yeah, they, they certainly are. And, you know, part of my question comes from Matt. I'm trying to trying to understand where we might be in terms of what inning in the cycle of the American empire. And, you know, I, I have my bias here. Like I, I'm my family's Canadian American, right? Like I, that's uh, that'll tell you where my bias lies, what I'd like to see happen. Right. Uh, having said that, if you're a student of history, you don't have to look back very far, maybe 600 years, and you'll find five other global superpowers have rose and fallen, right? And we've seen the Portuguese Empire, Spanish Empire, the Dutch Empire, the British Empire, now the American Empire. That's a very compressed timeline to see that many powers rise to global domination status and should give you a bit of a hint at the expeditious nature with which power rotates around the world. And so I look at that and I'm like, okay. So therefore, where might we be? And you touched on this sort of the financial weakness of the American empire right now. It's more or less an insolvent state, you know, and you often see that during the declining years. You, you touched on the cultural weakness. We often see the internal conflict rise to a place that kind of borders on civil war. And I don't know if we're there, but you could argue that we're getting close. I mean, it's not a hard argument to make. And the third piece after insolvency, internal conflict is external competition, right? That you often see at the in in the declining years of the empire. And it's often not one rising competitive power. It's often like a syndicate 
of other countries who may be ideologically different, but find alignment in their desire to unseat the global superpower and strike while the iron's hot. If you're one of those countries, I mean, just for all the reasons we just discussed and, you know, I, I, when, when this invasion occurred right away, I thought the most concerned party at the table might be Ukraine right now because they've been so reliant on public sentiment in the U.S. funding their war, essentially. Um, whatever percent of Americans were for defending Ukraine, it's going to be exponentially higher that are for defending Israel, right? I think that's a fair assessment. But we've depleted a lot of resources and we've depleted a lot of arms. And, you know, we had a reserve arms storage in Israel that's been depleted to fund Ukraine's war. So right away, I was like, if you're going to make a move on Taiwan, now's the time. I mean, isn't that how you attack an empire? You pick off these little proxy battles that are kind of arms reach and deplete the resources indirectly, further weakening the empire and accelerating the decline. Uh, what do you think about all of that, Matt? I, I think you've hit a lot of really important points. Again, highly controversial, but at the same time debatable, but yet there's a lot of clear evidence. Um, you know, most empires, you look historically, as you mentioned, from the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the British, now the US, even the Roman and the, and the Ming dynasties, you go back, they, it typically lasts about 250 years, which is right on target for the US since its declaration and its constitution. Even, you know, our founding fathers, Ben Franklin, was walking out of the, uh, out of the streets on Philadelphia when we signed our our, our, our declaration and then our constitution, some passerby said, hooray for democracy and republics. He says, be careful. They all die by suicide. You tie that political reality into the financial reality. I've talked about this in many presentations in German and English and every chance I get that if you just look at history, you step outside of bond spreads, market risk, default risk, you know, junk bonds versus sovereign bonds. And you just look at simple history. Um, the sad reality is throughout history, and I've said this over and over without exception, and this is from David Hume in 1752 to Von Mises at the turn of the century, even John Maynard Keynes. David Hume said this, and he's a philosopher, mathematician, all nations die by debt. And that's a really dry topic. Again, I beat it to death, debt, when I beat the bond market because it's so important. But when a nation is this far in debt, it's so abstract. It, it, the, the numbers are absurd. When a nation is this far in debt, the rest of the world catches on. And, and debt always leads to a number of syllogisms, a, a process. Debt leads to a financial crisis. It leads to a currency crisis. It leads to inflation, which is certainly not dead. You don't have a soft lane and go into that. Inflation leads to social unrest because that's a crisis on Main Street or Hauptstrasse or wherever you are. That You feel that invisible pain and the middle class is getting clobbered right now. And that leads to social unrest and and a lot of times that social unrest, as Hemingway warned, can be uh, addressed or ignored or distracted by war. And, 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 and other nations can see when a nation's weak. It's Darwinian. It's like animals in the jungle. They see with the weaker, the weaker lamb and the lion's paw. You know, they, they pounce. America is a hard beast to put down. And I'm not saying it's over. We are at a fourth turning. I think it's largely driven by self-inflicted wounds of overspending, living beyond our means, extending and pretending, living in a military-like emergency when we're not at war for all these decades, but spending it like as if we were in a war economy. Uh, politicians who are afraid to face the elephant in the room of debt and extending and pretending and pushing debt cycles out, debasing the currency to, to control bonds and to support bonds and to support re-election. We've got a lot of platitudes, as I've said, replacing bad math, but the world knows this is a typical person on Main Street knows America is not what it used to be because America is broke. It has that Ferrari appetite with that busboy salary. It can't police the world because it can't afford the world. The only way it can continue to do so is to continue to synthetically create money that debases the currency. The, de -currency, the currency debasement creates the arrival of the BRICS plus and the de-dollarization, which again is a slow process, but all these things are tied together. Countries are getting away from a weaponized dollar, an overpriced US treasury, an overpriced dollar. So you see it in, in financial ways and you see it in political ways and you see it in the fraction of our society. You also see it with military opportunists um, from Putin to, to Hamas to what, what's next. God knows. I hope it doesn't get worse, but it could come from China. And I hope I'm wrong on that. But regardless of whether war expands, the genie's out of the bottle. America's broke. They've weaponized the dollar. A large portion of the world, including now Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, you know, Argentina, and et cetera, are moving east, not 
de-dollarizing, not killing the dollar, but they're just moving around it. And to use another military analogy, it's like the Maginot line that the French built after, you know, after World War One, the disaster they want. You create this defensive wall, but the Germans didn't try to destroy the Maginot line. They just marched around it. They just circumvented it. And in a lot of ways, a lot of nations, this is not militarily, but financial, the financial war, the financial move away from the dollar is they're just marching around the dollar. Um, you've got more than 42 countries, 44 countries now in bilateral trade agreements outside of the U.S. dollar. That gets way past the hype of the gold do- gold-backed BRICS currency or the end of the world reserve currency or the end of the U.S. dollar. I totally think that was hype. And for my industry, there's a lot of hype in the gold space. But it doesn't change the fact that there is a clear and obvious and irrevocable slow process turning away from the U.S. dollar. The venerability of the U.S., that image of America with the flag on Iwo Jima and with Russia's support, defeating fascism and saving the world in the 40s and doing the Bretton Woods Conference and creating a gold-backed world reserve currency and this iconic America from Hollywood to baseball to apple pie and McDonald's, all those things that make me very proud as an American, though sadly that iconic America is being replaced by a debt-soaked America, a socially fractured America, a politically divided America. Those divisions and fractures, it's no coincidence that they come at a time when you're broke. Think about it in your own family, in your own marriage, in your own relationships from high school to today. When you're under financial stress, you're not the best boyfriend, you're not the best dad, you're not the best pal because you're worried, you're stressed, and you're angry. And we have so much of that because of our policies, not just debt, but the the, the quantitative easing post-2008, the wealth inequality when you have a 600% rise in the S&P that's really only benefited the top 10%. They're most, the majority of Americans, and I know a lot of them can't get through the month and they're worried about their rent, their car payments, their 20% credit card interest rates, which is 15% higher than the Fed funds rates that the banks and the corporations get. They feel the inequality. They feel the resentment. They don't need to be global macro economists or congressmen uh, to understand, frankly, our congressmen don't understand economics at all, but they feel the reality of the themes we're talking about. And that creates this kind of anger nationally and globally. This resentment leads to, I've got nothing to lose. Let's go for it. And sadly, you know, that can have military expressions and violent expressions, not just bond market expressions or political debate expressions, but even our politics. And again, this isn't meant to be personal. You've got a guy like George Santos who lies overtly and runs for Congress and wins. Again, I joke, he'd be fired from my office in 20 seconds. You got Mitch McConnell, God bless him, but he's way past his prime. He's just standing there for a full minute with his mouth open, who can't speak. You roll in Dianne Feinstein or whatever. Again, it's not meant to be partisan. Or you look at Justin Trudeau and who really is supporting him. And again, left or right, and then you see censorship, whether it's Russell Brand or Rob, you know, Jordan Peterson or Tucker Carlson, people are just like, what the heck's going on? What's all these civil liberties, all these things that we thought were part of our free markets, our free economy, our free democracy are weaponized now. There's a growing distrust of all these things. If that's happening within Canada and within the US, other countries that have ex- imported our inflation, imported our bullied US dollar for decades, they're broke too. They're pegged to our currency. They're pegged to our interest rate. They're pegged to our inflation. They're frustrated. And they're saying, who's going to save us now? And to your earlier point, a lot of other countries will, they may not be friends. They may not totally trust each other, but the enemy of my enemy is my friend or the financial enemy of my financial enemy is my friend. And that's why you're seeing the BRICS plus. And that's why you're seeing conversations or debates about de-dollarization where Brent Johnson and I, who frankly agree on 99.9% of what is the future of the US dollar. Brent and I both agree I'd rather have gold than a US dollar, but we have debates about how long this US dollar can last and none of us really know. But the world reserve currency, the world reserve democracy, the world reserve icon, America, whether we like it or not, whether we're from it or not, um, it's not what it used to be. And so when that world cop starts to lose its shine and its trust and its respect, um, a lot of things start to crack. Uh, again, beyond just financial markets, bond markets, precious metal discussions, currencies. And, uh, you know, it's, again, to your first point, it's all kind of verbunden, we say. It's all tied together. I publish a weekly newsletter every Sunday. If you would like to subscribe, hit the link right beneath this video. Now, I'm an investor, but I don't write about managing money. I write about managing my mind. Without question, the hardest and most important part of allocating capital through volatility and getting some back. If you want to read my newsletter, hit the link right beneath this video. I know you'll love it. Now back to the interview. Enjoy. Yeah. You know, and you're comment about Brent's obviously, you know, 
Good, good buddy. You've been on the show many times. And isn't that the case with with almost all debates in finance? It's just it just comes down to time horizon most of yeah, the time. Yeah. Like mo yeah. most frequently, I find that that's where because yeah. you guys both land on the same camp and probably on the eventuality. I know I, yeah. well, I've spoken to Brent so many times. He also yeah. agrees the U.S. dollar will eventually diminish to yeah. zero, right? Yeah. As every fiat currency has, but it's just a matter of time horizon. Um, yeah. It's funny how that rarely gets addressed, though, in financial debate. We'll argue back and forth for hours at a time and never actually come to the point. Like, we agree yeah. it's the time horizon that we, we're not addressing here. Right. Okay. So uh, I want to get back to something that you said about uh, sort of transitioning from a unipolar to a multipolar world, right? You know, one metric that I've watched over the last two years to sort of add affirmation to that is the UN vote on whether or not to support, or sorry, whether or not to uh, um, uh, condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine, because the vote's quite weighted in favor of condemning, right? It was like 141 countries condemned, 38 abstained or did not condemn, right? And I, you could look at that and say, oh, they're they're for or against Russia or Ukraine. But I look at that as a proxy vote for, no, you're pledging your allegiance to the East or the West. That's what's really happening here. And the interesting part to me is how many abstained, how many weren't clear enough to make their call yet, you know, and notable countries like Saudi Arabia, who are essentially saying, we're going to let you wine and dine us here. We're not ready to throw our uh, lot in with one of you, right? So you're going to have right. to, to prove which we should prove our allegiance to. Um, is that how you would see that? And um, and talk to me more about your multipolarity thesis, Matt. Yeah, look, I mean, it reminds me when you talk about the UN and the Ukraine, it's like in the Iraq war, the you know, when when Powell came to the UN with a dossier from the CIA with weapons of mass destruction and you know, pounded his shoe on the table saying, We've got to this is the moral thing. Um, and then there was Bush had the coalition of the willing, all these countries that were supporting the US in that war in Iraq, which in retrospect, which is always 2020, turned out to be maybe a mis mistaken invasion, or maybe it was very deliberate for reasons that had nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction. The point is. It was more a coalition of West versus East, or frankly, if you want to get more specific, following the U.S.'s lead. In a lot of ways, the European Union followed the U.S. because we're tied to the hip financially and economically. You could argue that we're morally on the same page, and, and that's fair. Again, it's not meant to be right or wrong, but there is a tremendous amount of financial coercion to not go against the, the biggest guy in the block, and that is the U.S. dollar and the U.S. Treasury. It's part of our derivative market. It's part of our SWIFT system. It's part of our trade alliances. If you're in the West, you don't want to overtly say no to the U.S.'s policy. And the U.S.'s policy was very clear um, that they weren't really interested in a peace negotiation. It was Zelensky is, is, is George Washington and, and Putin is Hitler, and we're going to support democracy and freedom. There's a lot of nuance behind whether that's right or wrong. And the question is, are, are, are countries really able to make a clear, overt statement morally, financially, and politically when the U.S. is in the room? I think when you turn that into what's happening with de-dollarization or the rise of the BRICS or the BRICS Plus, um, again, my, my feeling is it's not even that, you know, you have companies like the United Arab Emirates or Bahrain or Qatar. They're not necessarily enemies of America. They're pegged to the U.S. dollar, but they, they have one thing in common with other BRICS countries. And, and now you see the U.A. and the Saudi Arabia coming in is they are tired of the US dollar being the tail that wags the global dog. And they're tired of being pegged to its interest rate policy and its dollar, which frankly is being debased by the day because of synthetic liquidity and twin deficits and money printing. There's a direct correlation to that and the dollar and the M2 supply. But in, 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 at 30,000 feet, the dollar like the nation just isn't what it used to be. And the petrodollar, like the nation, isn't what it used to be. And the U.S. Treasury market isn't what it used to be when Kissinger was running around in the 70s trying to convince Saudi Arabia with interest rate hikes and a strong dollar that this was a good, stable peg to the petrol sale. So there's a lot of reasons countries like Saudi Arabia are on the fence. But, you know, Saudi Arabia go a classic fist pumps, Powell, fist pumps Biden and shake Xi's hand because Saudi Arabia at some point knows the volatility of oil priced in a non-gold-backed dollar is a lot more volatile than it was when there was a gold-backed dollar. And China's a big, thirsty buyer of gold. But let's not underestimate, to Brett Johnson's point, the power of U.S. dollar demand, the power of the U.S. dollar and the U.S. treasuries. So the word, word, we're, not, it, it, we're not at a switch turning point where the world goes against the dollar. But what we're seeing is a very slow process. De-dollarization, I said, from the day the Ukraine started, war started and the sanctions started, this was a very slow but irrevocable process where that weaponized world reserve currency, which again, Robert Triffin warned the Congress in the 60s, John Maynard Keynes warned, 
don't weaponize a world reserve currency. Again, you can do that with maybe Iran or Venezuela because they're moral bad guys and they're little guys. When you weaponize a world reserve currency against a strong nuclear power with deep ties to China and other large nations, that's going to have ripple effects, distrust. And what we're seeing isn't necessarily a hatred of the U.S. or the U.S. people, but there's a distrust of its policymakers, of its monetary policy, and of its weaponized reserve currency. And I agree with Brent Johnson. That reserve currency status is not going away anytime soon. The dollar is not going away anytime soon. The strength of the, the, the supremacy of the U.S. dollar is not going away any soon. But the hegemony of the U.S. dollar is going away irrevocably. And we're going from this unipolar, unipolar uh, kind of dollar-driven world to a multipolar world, of which the BRICS are the ultimate symptom. And again, you've got more than 40 countries doing bilateral trade agreements outside of the U.S. dollar. They're going around the Maginot Line. They're not going to defeat the Maginot Line. They're not going to defeat the dollar anytime soon. But every time China, for example, um, wants to buy oil from Russia and gives and gives the Russians yuan or CNY for that oil, well, then Russia can convert that in the Shanghai exchange into gold. And you can see that there are ways to barter basically outside of the dollar. In some ways, the BRICS are a glorified barter economy. They don't have the capital markets, the bond markets, the currencies to create a common currency, but they can do bilateral trade agreements. And those trade deltas can be settled in commodities and particular precious metals to get through that. Now, I see that happening very slowly, but very irrevocably now. And the number of agreements outside of the dollar is real. So that will mean less and less demand for that US dollar. Uh, but to Brent Johnson's point, the, the derivative markets, the euro dollar markets, there's still going to be strong demand for that dollar. But on the flip side, it's almost the flip side of Brent Johnson's point, which I want to talk to him about in November is you know, fine, if you need more dollars, you're going to need to sell more U.S. treasuries to get liquidity to get those dollars like Saudi Arabia had to do in 2020. They they loved they needed the dollar for liquidity. They had to sell U.S. treasuries to get more U.S. dollars to cover the oil deficits. Well, if you have to sell U.S. treasuries, that puts stress on the treasury market, though. So you're, you're, these other countries that have $7.5 trillion worth of U.S. treasury now, they need dollar liquidity for the strong dollar thesis. They got to sell treasuries. That puts more supply in the treasury market price pressure on treasuries, yields and interest rates go up, that forces America and other, and other borrowers of the U.S. dollar to, to pay higher for their debts. And that creates a, you know, a debt problem. And, and, then, and then they have to print more money to pay those debts. So it's a vicious circle. It's either a strong dollar or an inflated dollar, but it still ends, as Brett and I agree, in an inflated debased dollar. But yeah, the world is clearly uh, slowly but surely and irrevocably from the BRICS to the BRICS plus six to the BRICS then, and we'll see what happens tomorrow, making trade agreements. China's been building infrastructure in Africa and South America. They're building this the trade networks for physical exchange, and they'd rather exchange those trade deals in in real assets rather than a debt-based or a debt-backed U.S. dollar, which is based on a U.S. Treasury, which is a declining asset from a bad credit. I mean, literally, Fitch just downgraded the U.S. Treasury this year. Technically, Johnson & Johnson and Microsoft have a less of a chance of defaulting than the U.S. Treasury. But we know that the U.S. Treasury won't default because we know eventually and ultimately there will be a need for synthetic liquidity. And as long as central banks and the Fed in particular, 12 unelected officials who have complete price control over the world economy, they will always print more money to support that treasury market, that bond market. Um, and, and they'll do that at the expense of the currency. In every crisis, in every national crisis, the currency is the last bubble to pop. It will be sacrificed to save the system. The rest of the world, which is tied to that world reserve currency, doesn't want to inherit a debased currency from a declining credit and a declining asset. And that's why we're seeing this slow, very slow process of de-dollarization. And that's why we have to get away from the hype of the end of the US dollar. The world reserve currency is over. Um, the BRICS are going to have a gold-backed currency. They don't need a gold-backed currency. The European Union has already shown how hard it is to have a common currency, not even a gold-backed currency. The European Union has shown that it's not easy. And frankly, after Brexit I, and living in the European Union, we're all very concerned about the long-term viability of the European Union because the Germans who are in a recession, the French, don't necessarily like paying a lot of taxes or debates in their currency to support Italian bonds, for example. Is the European Union that strong? You tap on how strong it is to do in a European Union where you have capital markets, bond markets, a central bank, it's not going to happen among the BRICS. And then, and then to tap onto that a gold back currency, that was never going to happen. But again, it created a lot of hype. But you don't need all that hype because you don't need a gold back currency for the BRICS plus nations to still transact deals in deltas in precious metals or other real assets, which again, are better than a, than a debased 
world reserve currency and a weaponized, politicized world reserve currency. So all these things are tied together. But Jay, they all start because America got way over its skis in debt. And this, we can talk about, and I hope we do, this inflation thing. This notion of inflation is absurd, but we have too much debt and not the ability to pay for it, not from our GDP, not from our tax receipts, and we can't support our bond market. Eventually, we're going to pivot. The world knows that. The world knows that this otherwise powerfully supreme world reserve currency, which it earned in 1944, it just ain't what it was in 1944, and certainly after Nixon welched in 71. Hey, okay, so... I the way I understood a lot of that or a, a big section of it in terms of the dollar de-dollarization thesis, I I completely agree with. And I I you're right. It's often a sensationalized topic that all of a sudden one day, you know, a large percent of the world is going to transition just like hitting a light switch and move to right. you know different rails on a different currency. But what you're saying is that no, their countries are just building in some optionality. They're not trying to break through the marginal line. They're just forming little paths around it. They're on the margin, smaller transactions, but they're being established, little footpaths, right? That could be used right. as well, right? Some optionality. Uh, right. and, and that's what everybody should be doing in general. But I, I want to pull on a statement. You said this notion of inflation is absurd. Uh, a mm -hmm. sentence you said right at, the, right at the buzzer there. I want you to expand yeah. on that one for me a little bit, if you don't mind, Matt. Yeah, look, and there's the, we'll start with the obvious. And again, this is the gold bull apology, but it's really, again, I know a lot of people think that gold bulls are completely um, exaggerated and gloom and doom. I, I understand that. I, I don't agree. And I try my best to be, to be objective on this. But first of all, it's not an apology to say that the official inflation rate, the CPI rate out of the BLS in DC is an open joke. It's an open secret. Uh, and the recent interview with John Williams, I was watching again, if, 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 Powell wants to be Volcker and raise rates to fight inflation. That's fine. I don't agree with it at all. It won't work. But then let's use the same scale that Volcker used in the 80s and 90s to measure inflation. And as John Williams you know, made more clear than we can talk about in this conversation, but with abundance of detail, if you use the same scale that Volcker used in 80s or 90s, we'd have 11.5% inflation right now. So first of all, the very notion of what 3.7% inflation is today, I think is an open lie, not even a mistake or a modification of the Bureau of Labor Statistics fiction writing skills. No, it's just an open lie because I think we need real rates to inflate away our debt, but we can have it both ways by saying we're winning the war on inflation. But getting beyond just that, which I think is a fair and honest criticism of, 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 of really a sin of omission, omitting the facts. I think we're data dependent Fed, but that data is manipulated data. But getting past that potentially sensational statement, let's look at the dry math of the inflation argument. You know, Powell is looking for what, you know, the Fed officers and officials in Wall Street calls the terminal rate, that that Goldilocks number of interest rates, which will eventually kill inflation or pause inflation or fight or victory over inflation. And no one knows that that is because we haven't hit it yet to, to argue that we beat inflation today, I think, is a little naive. And I'll get into more reasons why. But let's say many people on Wall Street right now say, come on, Powell, you've beaten inflation. You didn't get to two percent, but you're at three point seven. That's good enough for us. Stop the QT, stop the rate hikes. Let's get back to normal. Let's get back to a, a more manageable cost of credit. And, and Powell, Powell doesn't agree. Wall Street certainly wants him to think that that's where we're at. But Powell also remembers his history. And if many people understand, he wouldn't know this. But when Volcker was raising rates, he stopped in 1980. And he paused. And then he actually reduced rates by 700 basis points, 700 basis points. And that was called the Volcker mistake because right after he cut rates by 700 basis points, inflation ripped, and then he had to raise the interest rates by 20%. And so Powell is arguing or thinking, I don't want to make the Volcker mistake. I want to be known as the next Volcker, but I don't want to make that mistake. So I may go higher for longer. Well, the, 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 the elephant in the room that everyone's missing, including Powell, I don't know how he could miss this, is comparing himself to Volcker, whether he makes the Volcker mistake and pauses too soon or reduces too soon, he wants to avoid that. Even if he didn't do that and wanted to be better and stronger than Volcker, what Powell forgets is Volcker was looking at a national debt of less than a trillion in 1980. We're looking at 33 trillion. So what I'm arguing, and I'll say it till I'm blue in the face, is Powell will never find the terminal rate to beat inflation. It's too late. He can never beat inflation through raising rates because the cost of our debt is going too high. He can't afford to raise rates by 20%. That would destroy our, our country overnight. How he doesn't know that, he does. And yet this, this lie 
by omission and this platitudes replacing math continues to be the narrative. I'm waiting for the NBER to tell us we're in a session, et cetera. But to say that we've beaten inflation is literally um, like Hitler declaring war when he marched into Moscow It's just or Napoleon or anyone. It's We've hit a Gettysburg moment where we're still pretending we're going to win this war. And it's clearly over for Robert E. Lee and for, and for Jerome Powell. And I think he he has to understand what Luke Roman and frankly the St. Louis Fed have been arguing. You we have reached that point of fiscal dominance where we're not going to reach a terminal rate that cures inflation because our debt levels are too high. And the more he raises rates, the cost of our interest expense on our national debt becomes unaffordable, which means the only way to pay it is to eventually pivot to more mouse click money. We did that last year to the Treasury Department. The Treasury Department pivoted for us. Yellen pivoted for us by entering the TGA account to create liquidity. The two big, you know, the TBFT program bailed out the banks, which we should talk about too. We did create backdoor QE inadvertently, but eventually we're going to have to literally return to just mouse clicking trillions to support our bond market and our system. And that will be inherently inflationary. So Powell's war on inflation is a ruse, in my opinion. It will not be one. We are going to have to pay the interest spent on our raising cost of debt as our debt expands 1.9 trillion by the end of this year in new debt and another 5 trillion to be issued if treasuries next year. We don't have the money to pay for those IOUs. We don't have it naturally through GDP or tax receipts. That is not a gold bug. A gloom and doom statement. It is basic math. It's a massive mismatch between supply and demand. If there's no natural demand, and even if you take the milkshake theory and you say that there'll be natural demand, the derivative market, euro dollar market, I'm saying I think that flow has already come in. I could be wrong, but even if we have that, it doesn't cover the gap. They're going to have to. They're going to have to pivot towards some type of liquidity QE or QE like measure. Even our reverse repo markets are down 45 percent. There's less liquidity there. That's not making the headlines because reverse repo markets are boring. U.S. Treasury markets are boring. The amount of IOUs we're going to issue, those don't make the headlines of people struggling to get through the month. What I'm saying without getting in all the weeds is there just is not enough money naturally to pay for the IOUs that we're living off of. And so we're going to have to print more money to cover that debt. And that is inherently inflationary. And so there is no way out of this inflationary scheme. And it goes to my earlier point that every national crisis, whether it's a king, a democracy or a tyrant, ends in a debasement of the currency. From Weimar in the 30s to Yugoslavia in the 90s to France in the 1780s, literally naming an, an exaggerated fallen empire, or frankly, England before by the end of World War II, they could not contain or c continue with their empire status because they were broke. And America is technically broke. And I know that sounds sensational, but again, we could still pipe the weeds of the data um, it's it's pretty disturbing. And we have a massive financial crisis. And again, I, I'll pause in a second. I just want to make this really clear, the mismatch between what Main Street Americans or Canadians or Europeans feel and what central banks are doing and how it's so unjust and how it's creating tensions. If you look at this you know, SVB collapse, that was a contagion effect that they were afraid that you know, SVB and these other smaller regional banks, well, that's just contained now. It, it really wasn't contained. It's important for listeners to understand that Using the reverse repo facilities, the central bank basically guaranteed the commercial banks post SVB that their U.S. treasuries, which have lost 20 percent, the 10 years lost 20 percent on the dollar since Powell started raising rates. So they had a market risk, just like SVB, Goldman Sachs. I don't care what their depository accounts, J.P. Morgan. B of A, Citigroup, all of them were still seeing a lot of treasuries, not nearly as concentrated, but they were losing 20% on their collateral. What no one understands is that the central bank basically gave them par value. In other words, instead of losing 20 cents on the dollar, the, the central banks guaranteed that they could get cash for that at par. So Americans on Main Street holding U.S. treasuries didn't get that. That was a multi-trillion dollar bailout to prevent a contagion. We just had a hidden bailout of the two big to fail banks right under our noses in plain sight by guaranteeing U.S. 10-year treasuries. By the way, the 30-year treasury lost 50% since Powell's rate hike. So these declining assets, which should have caused a bank failure, were bailed out through the back door using the reverse repo markets. I don't want to get into all the weeds, but we effectively guaranteed their market risk. Then, and I'll stop at this, default risk. What should have happened? Junk bonds across America should have tanked. They should have tanked because like, they didn't know, wait, the spreads on the junk bond and the spreads on the treasury should have been, you could have drive a truck through it because there would have been a dumping of zombie companies and zombie bonds. And the biggest buyers of junk bonds are insurance companies and annuity companies. And the bank regulators are supposed to say, you have to have a lot of capital reserves, Mr. Insurance Company or Mr. Annuity Company, if you're going to hold junk. Otherwise, you got to dump those junks. 
But what, what again, what went unnoticed by 99% of the world is the regulators just told these annuity companies and insurance companies, don't worry. You don't have to have deep capital reserves or cash accounts. Just go ahead and buy those junk bonds and lever their way. Go to town. So, you know, that's incredibly, that's a backdoor bailout of junk bonds. It's a backdoor bailout of, of too big to fail banks. It's just completely off the discussion right now. And that is two different markets. The insider markets for junk bonds and corporations and banks and the Main Street markets where Americans are paying student loans and 20% credit cards. And the credit card debt in America on Main Street is over a trillion dollars right now. So there's a bifurcated credit system, a bifurcated bailout system. Again, it goes back to our original conversation. People may not know all these details, but they look around and they say, there's something wrong. Something's not fair. There's wealth inequality. There's one rule of accounting for this group of people. There's another rule of accounting for me. Um, I'm going to have to pay this out. I'm going to have to bail this out, out of my taxes, but I can't even make it through the month. These things are very real. This is not gold bug gloom and doom. And again, there's plenty of gold bug gloom and doomers. I was a bond trader and I was a stock trader before I was into gold. I still look at these metrics. I look at the implied volatility of the treasury. The downside risk on US 10 years is greater than it is for gold right now. Fitch just downgraded our SM, I mean our, our US treasury. We're broke. And again, that sounds so sensational, but where are we going to get this money? It's not coming from GDP. It's not coming from tax receipts. And we're not going to get 20, 30% GDP when our debt to GDP is at 120%. We're not going to get growth when we have an anchor tied to both our ankles. We're trying to swim to the shallow end. It's just mathematically not possible. It's a long-winded way of saying not buying the war on inflation. We don't have a soft land that I joked in another interview the other day. If soft landing, we've got 400 bankruptcies this year. We've got countries, companies like Spotify, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Goldman Sachs laying people off. The top 10 bankruptcies are come for 200,000 jobs. We're waiting for the NBER to tell us we're in a recession when we're already in a recession. Year over year money supply, inverted yield curve, the drying up of the repo markets, the hikes. These are all massive recession indicators. We are already in one. And I'm saying what DC and Wall Street are trying to do is replace these truths with platitudes and words. They are sensational. The facts as we know them now, not even projecting or predicting, are sensational enough to quantifiably say that we're broke. Our treasury markets are volatile. They were at the beginning of this year. They're going to be at the end of this year. We are living off borrowed time and, and adjectives and fake nouns and, frankly, false data to keep the machine going. And uh, I think the rest of the world knows better, but the financial tries to keep us. And, and the average guy in Main Street who has no interest in all these details, I fully respect that. He doesn't need it. He feels it. And that's why that Oliver Anthony song, you know, Richmond, North of Richmond, this famous song that's got 90 or 80 million hits in one month. It's an anthem to the struggling middle class. It's an anthem to the broke who my dollar ain't worth X, you know, he uses an S word and I'm taxed to no end. That's the cry of the vast majority of Americans, probably Canadians, certainly many French and Germans that I see in Frankfurt or Paris or Toulouse or Bordeaux. They are barely getting by. <laughs> and so, yeah, this is, this is a, a tough time. And this inflation argument is a complete joke if you understand the circular math of it. Well, I think, you, and you nailed it when you said, you know, we're appeased with words and platitudes when in reality, they, they feel what they're going through. But it, it's shocking to me you know, so many of the metrics that you discussed, whether it's like, yeah, credit card uh, balances hitting a trillion dollars, credit card delinquencies looks like a hockey stick curve right now. Auto loan delinquencies look like the same thing. New credit card loan application rejections are hitting all time highs because people can't afford their monthly nut. They're right. seeking assistance through more debt and they're not getting it anymore. Yet, right. what do they do? They look to mainstream headlines to try to ask the question, are we headed towards a recession? And it's like, you're in one. What are you talking about? Like we, we set a record for bankruptcy filings in August. Like, what do you think a recession looks like? You ask the employers yeah. or the employees of those companies whether or not we're in a recession. Like, why why are you looking to Fox News for this? But people do that, right? They they look for affirmation in headlines, which gives the Fed a massive opportunity to tell you how your life is. Don't worry, we've got this under control. We're going to find the terminal rate, as you said, right? Which is, I love how you put this, that like, it doesn't exist. You know, you can, we're on the search for the terminal rate, but what does that mean? Like, you know, this is just, this just means that the Fed funds rate is going to be at a level where, so I want to dive into this concept of fiscal dominance a little bit with you, just to make sure I understand it. But, you know, essentially- well, then, Real quick, Jay, I want to give you one point, as you were saying this, the Fed versus reality or Main Street. Um, there was a poll, 0% of the Fed FOMC officers see a recession, 0%. Goldman Sachs, 15% see a possible recession. 
when you ask CEOs in a poll across the nation, CEOs that are hiring and firing and trying to roll over debt at higher rates, that number is 84%. So the, the, the spread between what the Fed says, 0%, are you kidding? We're already in a recession by just about every metric I can think of, including the Conference Board of Leading Indicators, which dipped below the 4% threshold last December. We are knee deep in a recession right now. Fed says 0%. CEOs across America say 84% see a recession. So, you know, am I a gold bug, apologist, gloom and doomer? No, I just look at the data, the evidence. I can't help it. It's the lawyer. It's the law student in me. I got to look at both sides. I try really hard not to be too cocky about precious metals or real assets, but our dollar is relatively strong as a horse in the glue factory. But to your point, CEOs and people on Main Street should know the difference, not the Fed and not Goldman Sachs. And I have a lot of friends and alumni from Goldman Sachs, but my daughter's there too. And I was there. I still don't trust it. But if I were Goldman Sachs today, I couldn't say these things and keep my job. I literally couldn't say these things because right. if, you're a, if you're a bear on Wall Street, you won't last through the season. Right, right. Okay. And then, and then so layered on top of this, we, we have this Fed policy where we're, we're trying to find the terminal rate that will normalize inflation at 2%. And you can attack, you know, the inflation formula all day long. I think there's tons of vulnerabilities and that formulation, as you mentioned, the basket of goods, just we just change it. Inflation's too high, we'll change right. the, the calculation. I get that. Uh, but either way, it doesn't matter so much because the interest expense on $32 trillion of debt is something we can't afford. And so therefore we have to print money to pay it, which is the definition of inflation. We're expanding the money supply in order to cover our debts. Um, and And I have to think that, you know, we're just getting started in terms of uh, people's inability to afford their lifestyle, whether you look at further inflation in response. And did, did I, you know, in a minute, let me know if that's the sort of the concept of fiscal dominance is, you know, we, we can't afford the interest expense, you know, as we're tweaking the rates up. So we print more money to pay the interest, which fuels inflation. So we have to tweak the interest rates. And it's this kind of, is that the, the debt death cycle? Maybe let's start with that. I want to make sure I understand that concept clearly. Yeah, you, I think you've done a really good job. Keep it simple, too, because the stupid is that simple right now. It really is. And it just needs to be clarified without getting into, you know, fancy lad Wall Street speak. Because, look, it's not 32 trillion, it's 33 trillion now. We're going to issue another 1.9, basically 2 trillion by in, into year end. And next year, we're projecting another 3 to 4 trillion in fiscal spending. So we're looking at 33 to 37 to 38. So we're expanding the debt. Just keep that in a vacuum. Just We're just expanding the debt. Add on top of that stovepipe reality that our debt is getting bigger. We're increasing the cost of that debt. We already have a debt level, which I, I, I don't mean to be flip, but it's like I said, it's Hannah Rent's discussion of the Holocaust. You're talking about millions of deaths. It becomes an abstraction. It's a banalization of evil, right? And when you have debt at 35, 33, 37, whatever, trillion that's a banalization of debt. It's a banalization of evil financial and monetary policy. It's a fiction. But when you get to 35, 33, 32, but we're well past that trillion, and then you have a, a, a central banker who's an unelected fourth branch of government raising the cost of that debt. And I understand you could say Powell's trying to take away the punch bowl. He's trying to be a better Volcker. I get all that heroic Powell, but at the end of the day, he can't not see that when you Powell has $33 trillion debt today, he'll have $38 trillion in a year. He's not Volcker, because Volcker can raise 20% rates in the 80s when, go, when debt is less than a trillion. You can't do it when you're at $35, 36000000000000 trillion. So what is Powell really doing? The Congress and the Senate are expanding our debt to stay elected and to look good in front of the camera. Powell's raising the cost of that debt. That means the interest expense on this debt. This is math. This is not gold bug, gloom and doom. The math means where's that money going to come from? If we don't have it naturally, it means we're going to have to create liquidity. We did it through the Treasury and the TGA last year with the, with the, uh, the, the Yellen pivot. We did it with the bank massive bailout in 2023 this year. At some point, we're just going to have to go back to the Eccles building and start mouse clicking zeros on our balance sheet and debase our currency more. That is the definition of inflation. It is tied to the money supply. And then you'll see M2 go up with the Fed balance sheet. You'll see inflation. And then you'll see policymakers in Congress and the Senate and at the central bank, which is the fourth branch of government today, blaming all of this on, well, it certainly was COVID's fault, which we mismanaged the policy of that, in my opinion. And then it's going to be Putin's fault. Um, probably could be um, little green men from Mars, I joke. That might be the next big fear. 
Certainly, it could be war in the Middle East or some breakout in China. It will never be the fault of the mirror in the bathroom of our central bankers and our, and, our, and our House and Senate, left or right, because they all stay elected by promising more than they can deliver and paying for that on the back of the next generation's uh, currency bill and tax bill. And that is how empires fall, because the people eventually get fed up of that. Uh, and, and for the top 1% or 10%, it's not good for us or anyone else to see wealth inequality this grotesque, this unfair, this co-opted, orchestrated, this Truman show that everything's fine. No, it's fine for the top 10%. It's not fine for the rest of America. They don't even know how they're getting screwed, but they're getting screwed and they feel it and they're singing about it and they're protesting about it. They're not anti-American. They're frustrated and broken. Just like the French in 1789 with pitchforks. They're just broke. It's the Russians in 1917. They're just broke. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day. If you stand out in the rain enough, you'll get in any car. If you're that frustrated, you'll try anything. And that's the risk that we're seeing geopolitically, militarily, uh, financially. People are not necessarily fully informed as to how they're getting screwed, but they feel it. And our, our policymakers, again, not trying to be anti-patriot, but they're not they're not doing the best they can for their country. They're doing the best they can for re-election. And they're not being blunt. And they're not being honest about debt. They're not profiles and courage. They're, they're, they're guys and gals that just want, uh, you know, a nice cush position somewhere in D.C. And they've sacrificed their integrity for the lofty title of an office that I would rather sell used cars than work in Congress right now unless someone was really willing to take a trance and tell the truth. We could we could maybe cut spending that, you know, instead of printing money, we could cut spending by 40 percent on entitlements and military. But again, good luck getting elected. You could you know, you could try that. Um, but short of cutting spending and admitting that we're broke and asking what we can do for our country, not what it can do for us. Very few people want to vote for people that say that, and very few people are willing to do it. So I think we're past that fourth turning. And it doesn't mean the end of the world, but it just means the next 10 years are going to be a lot more volatile than the last 10 years. So, you know, you answered a question that I, I had for you, which is, what is that the motivation of some of these decisions? You know, is it, is it, uh, is it just, self-preservation. I mean, it could be, and probably is that simple that we group, you know, government organizations together as some, you know, accountable structure or, or, but at the end of the day, it's, it's just humans subject to human nature, fear and greed, yeah. same as you and I, that's all there is yeah. to it. And it's not bigger than that. It really is that simple. And so at the core of those decisions is just self-preservation. It's uh, looking out for their family, looking out for themselves, right? Which we're kind of all doing, right? To a degree. We expect differently of our elected officials, our public servants, right? That's why we call them public mm -hmm. servants. But in reality, yeah. like who actually goes after those positions? Career politicians, right. like, you know, it's not a, right. I would never chase down a political, a seat in political office. Well, maybe. I mean, I feel like Canada needs it, man. Like I'm, I'm actually maybe, debating yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. I'm well, kidding. again, it, it, there are, there is a minority, I'm sure in every world, the 80, 20 rule, the Pareto optimality. There are, I'm sure there are, I, I think Cornell West or Robert Kennedy Jr. Or maybe Vivek Ramaswamy. I don't know. He's a billionaire who made his money in big pharma. So, but he's very brilliant. But I'm saying a guy like Robert Kennedy Jr. I'm not saying I'm voting for him. I'm just saying there are occasionally people who I really think don't want to go into politics, but they're that worried about their country. They're that fed up. Um, I, I think there are good people who maybe they have strong opinions. You agree with or disagree. I agree, disagree with a lot of things about Robert Kennedy Jr., but I admire his authenticity. It's the same with Cornell West or Vivek. I, I feel there's something authentic there. But again, there's such a small minority. The vast majority of political parties, I mean, political personalities left and right, I, I, I can find them complete twits. And yet... I don't think I'm alone in that, regardless of your color of politics. To your point about institutions, the three branches of government, the founding fathers, Canada, the U.S., the Constitution, they're brilliant ideological models. They're brilliant systems. And I've walked, obviously, many, many times through D.C., and you walk in front of the Capitol, you walk in front of the Department of Treasury, you walk in front of Congress, you go to the White House, you see these impressive buildings. The Federal Reserve on Constitutional Ave is one of those impressive buildings ironic it's neither federal nor a reserve it's on constitutional lab and frankly i think it's an unconstitutional body it's not even it's what you know hamilton and jefferson fought about it's not even supposed to be constitutional but take away all those beautiful buildings and ideals it's still filled to your point with human beings and the question is this is where markets and economy and history cover philosophy and psychology what is man it's the hobbs lock thing is he good or bad is he generous or selfish but even the most selfish 
at some point realize, and we've done it because we're all guilty of it. We're all selfish. We're all greedy. We all want money. But even me or myself and people I know who've hit that tipping point where they had more money than they needed, there's a point where enough is enough. I don't need billions. And a lot of people don't need Bezos yachts to be content. And there is something pathological about the mismatch of wealth and the ratio of management salaries to, to worker salaries has gone off the charts because greed has gotten pathological in this generation pathological way past my grandparents generation my grandfather was at 40 he was an executive but he didn't make 90 times his his best manager right bezos has a 1.2 million to one ratio to his management the average is 320 to one so there is in native american culture if you had too much stuff in your teepee they needed to do an intervention there's something wrong with you you have yeah. too much right i'm a capitalist true and tried but there is something wrong with the wealth inequality at the levels we have it where a few families in america own more wealth than 50 percent of the population so again it's not communist it's not socialist i'm full-born capitalist but we have too much power too much greed in the hands of a very small minority that is the opposite of what our founding fathers when they drafted our constitution that i studied in law school at a good law school it's the opposite of what we were aiming for and 250 years later to your original question we're certainly at a turning point right now in America and it's socially, fiscally, and it's all tied also to our debt and finances. And then political opportunists, as Hemingway warned, that will debase the currency and go to war. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, it, yeah, it gets back to the front end of this conversation when we talked about the rise and fall of empires and one telltale sign that you see in that falling empire blueprint. We, we, we call it cultural unrest or civil unrest, but it, it comes in response to uh, wealth inequality. That's that's what's at the, mm -hmm. the foundation yep. there. People know their life is worse than a lot of individuals they can see. They know they feel poorer than they used to, all this stuff, but they don't understand why. And so they start right. looking for an enemy, right? Right. And I used to think, you know, part of this was just a lack of financial education. Like you can go to, you know, 12 years of, of public school education, you graduate, you still don't know what a capital gain is or an interest rate is, or, right. you know, right. you don't get taught this stuff. So People wake up at 30 years old with a hundred grand student loan debt and they look at the millionaires and they're like, wait a minute, I did everything right. right. Like I went to post-secondary, like I, you know, I, but I'm yeah. broke and they're not, they must've cheated. There's no way that we played the same right. game. And it's like, no, you played the same game, but only one of you knew the rules, right? Like you right. were sold right. this dream and it was a bad one. And I'm sorry, right. but that's what happened here, right? Uh, there's a lot there, but you know, a, a weekend public, does open up an opportunity, you know, so I just want to maybe wrap this interview with one last question here. You know, a couple of times, you know, we talked about, you know, there's no way out here for the, for fiscal dominance, debt cycle, all this stuff, right? There's, there's no decisions that can really be made by, by Powell or whoever comes next that will repair this, right? It's going one direction. That's sure how it seems. So my, my big question is, well, where does it go then? You know, and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we need some kind of a, a reset, it seems. When the public's on their knees, they're most receptive to solutions that may not be in their best interest. Mm -hmm. And that may be where we're headed, because I think that if life is somewhat unaffordable today, I think energy costs are just going up. I think inflation's going up. And I think we're going to continue down this path a little bit further, unfortunately. I wish it wasn't the case, but I think it is. And so, you know, do you see an outcome if you were to just think conceptually here, Matt, like what is the outcome from this situation? Uh, you know, again, I've said many times, again, history without exception confirms this. You go from the syllogism to debt, to financial crisis, to market crisis, to currency crisis, to inflation, to social unrest. That's always responded to by extreme centralization from the political left extreme or the political right extreme. Uh, it's not Gandhi and MLK or RFK who come in and save the day. It's usually demagogues and opportunists. So there's one risk that we just see more centralization, which we see in the censorship, which we see in malinformation being attacked, misinformation, disinformation. It's, again, this is not conspiracy. Theory. We're just seeing it. Lockdowns, mandates, uh, seizing financial accounts, uh, you know, weaponizing the media against people who just have different opinions than the powers that be. They're not terrorists or national security threats but you know this is what william pitt and you know milton said they'll always use suppression they'll excuse it because it's an emergency but it's really just an emergency of a financial crisis that they self-inflicted on us and so i and the, the pessimist in me sees more centralization uh and we're already seeing the evidence of that everywhere um literally everywhere uh, and then we haven't even talked about central bank digital currency or the centralization of our markets for the top 10%. You know, the S&P 500 has seven names that are up 92% this year. The other 493 are down. 
markets only up 12%. They were down 15% last year. We're not even recovering from last year's losses. We're calling this a soft landing in a robust economy. It's a joke. It's seven companies. What about the Clayton Act or the Sherman Act where I studied antitrust laws? Monopoly powers, robber barons. Again, I'm a capitalist, but I don't see real capitalism. I see feudalism with lords and serfs. I, that's what I see. And so I hope we don't see more centralization. I also don't want to see revolution, violence, and pitchforks because that doesn't work either. And sadly, uh, somewhere between centralization and pitchforks, we usually get war and inflation. Again, going back to Hemingway's point, going back to our original comments, distract, create an enemy, create a bad guy, create a Martian, create a virus, at least in the media. I'm not saying we created all this to kill people. I would say create a distraction that keeps the people's attention off the culprits or the guilty or even the mismanagement. I don't think every member of Congress or the Fed is out to hurt the middle class or hurt people. They just don't know enough. They don't care. They've gone far beyond the point of no return and they just can't say I was wrong. So we either have extreme centralization, we have pitchforks, or we have something in the middle, distraction, war, and, and more controls. And, and, and none of those are good. Or the best case scenario, the hardest, but best case scenario is we elect political leaders who are blunt with the audience, blunt about accountability, critical of saving and bailing out too big to fail banks, critical of auditing our central banks, allowing complete freedom of expression, freedom of movement, freedom of debate. Even if it's quacky, let people speak. Uh, we need more evidence-based conversations, not emotional conversations. Again, that's very Pollyannish. That's hard to imagine. But maybe, just maybe, instead of a demagogue, we get a new leadership and a new trust. I think if people trusted their governments, trusted their leadership, they'd be willing to make certain sacrifices for the sake of the country. Ask not what uh, your country can do for what you can do for your country. People don't want to do things for their country. They don't trust it if they're socially fractured, if they're broke, if they don't believe that that politician elected who's got four lobbyists attached to him is really thinking of their best interests. They don't trust their leaders anymore. I think if we could, on the best case scenario, get leaders that people trust, who are blunt and transparent about our fiscal problems, just like in a family, honey, we're not taking the honeymoon because I'm broke, or I spent too much at the casino, or I screwed up with the waitress I met at the cocktail party. You got to be honest. At some point, you got to tell the truth. And politicians are terrified of that. And so, and uh, central bankers are certainly terrified of that. So, I don't know. I, I really don't want to be just gloom and doom or just talk about currencies. I do hope that we can have this kind of amorphous, better actors, better angels and making decisions for us and that we can elect and, and, and really truly elect people that represent our interests. And, and there, there's always that possibility. In the meantime, I don't see any way out of inflation, further currency debasement, further distrust until, until we are all on the same page with the facts and the evidence without getting partisan or socially fractured or militant. And unfortunately, right now, those currents are pretty strong against us right now. You know, usually I would ask you like, okay, so how can people set themselves up, you know, for, cause this is sort of a, you know, a hardcore conversation and we covered a lot of like somewhat yeah. dire outlooks, but it's yeah, really important stuff. And I'm like, don't look at it that way. Maybe accept this as a pragmatic view of the world and an important one to mm -hmm. understand because mm -hmm. you live in it. Right. And mm -hmm. you don't want to sugarcoat uh, your own future, your perception of your future and where you mm -hmm. ended there, Matt, is exactly where I feel the power is. It's in your hands to cast your mm -hmm. vote and think critically about the people that we are putting in office. And, you know, are we electing people based on the fact that they're promising us a better life? Well, is that even an achievable promise right now? Like maybe right. take a to look at the individual who's brave enough to say, Things are going to get worse before they get better. We're going to have to do some yeah. really, really hard things. This isn't going to be yeah. easy. Maybe that's the message we should be seeking right now instead of, you know, the virtue signaling, I can fix yeah. this, you right. know, which has been sort of the, you know, I, I feel like I'm up in Canada right now, you know, and, and I hope Canadians are learning a lesson right now, a very important lesson. What happens when you elect somebody because you like their haircut? I mean, that's what yeah. occurred, right? Like yeah. we had Prime Minister Harper prior to Prime Minister Trudeau. The biggest criticism of him when he was in office was that he was boring. Like, right. wouldn't that be nice, right? Oh, you mean he sat at right. his desk and did his job? Like, <laughs> right. that, there's a problem with that, right. you know? He, yeah. he did what he said he was going to do, you know? And, and, and now we're learning what happens when you flippantly elect somebody because you like their image or their brand or their, you know, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. I got to... Yeah. 
another yeah. four hours of stuff I could say on that one. But I uh, know, yeah. I digress. Look, I really <laughs> appreciate your time, Matt. It's always fun chatting with you. I learned so much, man. So thanks for coming back on. I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I'll just give a quick warning, and it has nothing to do with gold or pushing gold. I, people are worried about the stock markets. I will make a couple, one really interesting point. The bond market's the thing. The cost of debt is the thing. Companies on the S and P, the vast majority of them are underwater. We have 740 billion in in, in, in maturities of corporate uh, debt next year, and another one trillion the year after that. That's how the S and P, by the way, falls when you can't roll over debt like you did in the last 10 years on low interest rates. And so it, it's not again gloom and doom. People are asking, what's the signal um, for a market correction? Watch the bond market. Watch the maturities of those uh, S and P companies that have to roll over their debt in 2024. And then in 2025, again, I'm not trying to be negative, but people keep asking, you know, why is this market still awake? They're awake because they're living on debt right now, expensive debt. Right now, they're locked in on low rates. Next year and the year after, those rates adjust higher. And that's that's when the, the, the music stops and there's just not enough chairs. I just want people to be aware that risk parity portfolio, stocks and bonds are hedged. They're not. They're correlated. Talk to your advisors. Be real risk sensitive. Look at real assets, not as a get rich quick and not as an easy vol non volatile trade. But I'm not talking precious metals even. Just look at these risks in the bond market and the stock market. I think they're going to get worse before they get better. And we're, we're not even in a robust stock market right now. We have seven names. The rest of them are either zombies that lived off uh, you know, debt rollovers or uh, stock buybacks. That game is over. The game that we lived the last 10 years is over in this rate environment. So please talk to your advisor about your risk parity portfolio if you do nothing else from this conversation. It, no, I really appreciate that. And, and you're right. You know, those seven names that kind of carry the S&P, but if I've got this right, I think five of them make up 24% of the entire market capitalization yeah, yeah, of the yeah, S&P yeah. 500, which is kind of like, you know, in if one falls, they all fall scenario. Uh, yeah. is how I sort of interpret that. And so just to recap what you said, you know, that, that a trigger point to watch will be $740 billion in corporate bonds that roll over in 2024 and another trillion that roll over in 2025. Yeah. Trillion uh, point two to be exact, they have to be refinanced at a higher rate. Um, again, it's just boring math. Less sensational than our dramatic conversation about all these really sad political and geopolitical and, and, and debt conversations, but the simple math. Again, I, I'm really frustrated by people that say that's just gold bug gloom and doom. Even if I were at a bond desk, I, I'd say the same thing. In fact, I spend more time looking at bonds and looking at precious metals because I'm interested in currencies. But again, inform yourselves. Don't don't worry about, don't take my word for it. Look at these things. Look at other people who are looking at these markets. Look at these data points. It's not sensational anymore. We don't need to be sensational. We don't need gold back bricks currency replacing the dollar hype from our industry. That doesn't help. The facts on the ground are sensational enough. The de-dollarization isn't hype. It's not the end of the dollar, but it's not even the biggest threat. The real threat to the U.S. dollar comes from within the U.S. economy, from within the Federal Reserve, from within uh, Washington, D.C. and Wall Street. So we don't need hype about de-dollarization. We don't need to fight about the strength of the dollar or whose fault it is or gold-backed currencies. No, it's just dying from within. And it'll be the same with the euro and the Canadian dollar and the Australian dollar. It's all, it's all similar. So for the stock market, look at those. Stock market flew on debt, on borrowed wings from debt. When the cost of that debt rolls over in 24 and in 25 at a much higher rate, a lot of those otherwise zombie companies that the top seven names can't hold up are going to get sinker and deeper, and it's just going to be tough on your portfolios. So, and just to make sure, you know, I just want to hammer that home one more time because I do think it's really important. That's essentially 2024, $740 billion in billion. debt held by S&P companies that was borrowed at like zero or near zero rates. Right. It's going to be rolled over in the next 12 months and they're going yeah. to be paying real time rates which are going to be around five plus percent this is what we're talking yeah. about yeah yeah it's we're a lot talking about a real uh oh moment yep. yeah yeah okay okay I, i'm glad you brought that up to cap it on uh i appreciate that man once again man it's, it's always great having you on so thank you my pleasure jay it was a real pleasure thank you for tuning in i hope you enjoyed this conversation now if you want to take the next step i publish a weekly newsletter and it's free. There's a link to subscribe right beneath this video and you can join me and 50,000 other investors weekly for this exclusive content where I share my key action items and takeaways from conversations just like this and plenty others. Thanks for stopping by.